have to be honest, I'm still really emotional from our last two speakers. Those were, those were incredible, and this is five really tough acts to follow. I'm gonna start grim, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna break it up a little bit. So just bear with me. Um, my story began with a photograph of a three-year-old Kurdish Syrian boy named Ailan. Probably a lot of you saw it. It came out in September of 2015, so almost a year ago. And Ailan was lying face down on a beach on a Greek island, an island that had been known for tourism prior to his arrival there. Um, and he was dead, and his hands were tucked under his body. He was wearing a red shirt and denim shorts. And at the time, Ailan was similar in size and age to my youngest son. And I told myself that that's why that photo affected me so strongly, but I couldn't get it out of my mind. And I'm already, much like Megan, I'm, I'm no stranger to anxiety and insomnia, but I spent many hours in the middle of the night, night after night, with Ailan and that image. And I thought about the contours of his calves and how his body was similar and dissimilar from my own son's. And that's how three months later I found myself on a plane to Athens um, and to the port of Piraeus, which is where ferries carrying at that time up to 10,000 refugees a day were arriving from the Greek islands. Um, the refugees would get on buses if they had the means and begin the thousand mile journey to asylum in Western Europe. So I wanna tell you three stories of people who I met who got away. First, I wanna tell you about Mohammed. Mohammed came off a ferry in the morning with his grandmother, grandfather, and younger brother. And he didn't speak a word of English, so everything I'm telling you is speculation, but I would say he was about 18 or 19 years old. He was like the Syrian Ricky Schroeder. He had these big dimples. He was in a state of shock, and yet he was utterly adorable and charming from minute one. And he and his grandfather were supporting his grandmother, who was in what to my untrained eye looked like severe diabetic shock. Her legs and her calves were very swollen. So another volunteer who was at the port, which is just a big series of docks and cargo, um, cargo shipping container yards. It's a very unfriendly place to arrive in Western Europe. Um, they called an ambulance and it came a couple hours later and took away grandmother, grandfather, and younger brother. So Mohammed was left to watch over their 15 or 20 small parcels, which just laid in this huge pile around his feet. And never before had I seen fear and loneliness and confusion like I did in his face. And luckily for Mohammed, there were six American moms who were really missing their children, who just flopped around him like mother hens and we gave him electrolyte drinks and trail mix, and we told him, it's very hot, take your coat off, and just get comfortable. Um, we had to leave him that night. We were not allowed to stay at the port. We had other ferries to meet, so we bought him some sandwiches and some Cokes. We took some pictures with him and squeezed his hands. We weren't sure if it would be appropriate to hug him. And then we left and we said goodbye. The next day, he was back, and so were we. About 24 hours later, Grandma was out of the hospital she did not look well enough to travel, but she didn't have a choice. Um, and Muhammad and his brother were sitting, looking shiftless, sad, and bored, with their backs against the wall of this empty warehouse space. So I took them this pallet of raisins and little wax bags that had been donated by people from Saudi Arabia. And I went over, and this is how I had to communicate with people a lot, because my Arabic is horrible. And I went over and I went like this. This was the ferry, like, hey, when the ferry comes, it walks out. <laughs> and he was like, all right, okay, okay. So a while later, um, our group was fitting baby carriers and handing out um, mother and baby supplies, so we had a pretty specific mandate. But a while later, I see Mohammed out there greeting 2,000 new arrivals in their native language, welcoming them to Europe and to safety and to freedom, and handing out these little wax bags of raisins. What I love about his story is he went from victim to activist in 24 hours. He was totally different in posture and mannerism and expression from the young man that I'd seen the day before. He was a helper, as Fred Rogers would call it. 
He was out there, he was assisting, he was playing a role, he was giving back. Um, and as a side note, the next night, we met a night ferry at midnight. Muhammad's family was there and they were getting on a bus to Macedonia. Two weeks later, we did hear kind of through our volunteer pipeline that they made it to Germany. So Muhammad got away. Um, four graduate students from Damascus got away. This is, this is a story that I hesitate to tell because I have to admit to my um, mortality and my lack of athletic prowess. Um, you can look at me and know that I'm not imbued with a lot of athleticism, but it really came to a head in this story. So I was on a bus. I would followed some families with young children on a bus, again, bound for Macedonia. And the driver said, you have 10 minutes and then we're leaving. I said, no problem, no problem. So I climbed on and I helped fit baby carriers on some parents and showed them how they could use the carriers to help um, on their thousand mile journey to Western Europe. And um, when I finished, I realized this bus had this really strong sense of community. Everyone was talking to each other. I have the sense that they had all left Syria together, come through the smugglers route and kind of arrived in Greece still as a pretty intact unit. And there was just this real feeling of warmth and friendliness on the bus. So I started kind of joking around with these, these young men. And here I'm gonna be really wildly sexist and inappropriate and just note that Syrian men are ridiculously good looking. <laughs> um, and so these men were just charmers. Their English was incredible. I was finally able to ask a lot of the questions I wanted to ask but hadn't maybe had the language skills for. And as I was handing out some treats to the children that I had just fit with carriers, one of the men said, do you have any more food? And I said, oh yeah, I've got all kinds of stuff. And we had these vests with lots of pockets. And I had my dad's horrible fanny pack that I had borrowed purely from his friend and a backpack. And so I take everything out and I'm handing out snacks. But in that process, one of the men didn't get a granola bar or anything. And I kind of, at this point we have a, a shtick and I said, sorry buddy, you're gonna have to share with a friend. And he looked me in the eyes and he said, no one on this bus has eaten for four days. And you know, Boy, was that a reality check. And I looked around and I realized everyone was absolutely diving into and devouring the snacks that I handed out. So I said, okay, I'm gonna get you food. And so here I was wearing these Athleta pants that I thought would be like very practical for humanitarian work, but which as it turns out had a little too much stretch. So holding my pants up in one hand, I sprinted. I've told this story several times and as I told my parents, I ran like the fate of a hungry bus full of refugees depended on me. I, my feet had wings, and holding out my pants, I ran down the hill. Um, we were lucky to have an Iraq war vet on our team, a, a mother of three um, who had earned a Purple Heart. She was a physical beast. And so when I met her, she sprinted ahead, put a big box of food on her shoulder, ran it back up to the bus, and we stood back to back, handing food up and down the aisles of the bus. So here's what I learned from those four men. They were the most visceral, amazing counter narrative to the toxic narrative that we receive about Middle Eastern men. That they are all ISIS, that they are all jihadis, that they are all fundamentalist terrorists. These were four beautiful, intelligent, compassionate men making sure that the women and children had food first, making sure that everyone had their fair share joking with the American, thanking me even though I was able to do so little for them in the grand scheme of things. But I'm happy to tell you that that bus full of about 85 people got away. A little white dog got away. I don't know, I'm a big dog girl, but I think it was some sort of Maltese. And I met a, a boat and this large family with lots of children came along with this little white dog on a leash. And my first thought was, how the fuck did a dog make the journey from Syria? <laughs> this journey involves standing silent in the back of delivery trucks, packed like sardines, for 30 hours. It involves hiding in the forest in Turkey on the border of the Aegean Sea, waiting for snipers to leave so that you can get on a raft bound for Greece. How did a little dog make a raft journey? It was completely inexplicable, but that just made me love this dog and its family all the more. Um, but the clincher was a three or four year old boy who essentially walked up to me and put his arms up 
and invited himself up into my arms. And who was I to refuse? So I walked with this family. It was the, there were always pretty long walks to the buses, five or six walks. And I carried this little boy, and he talked to me the entire time. And we couldn't communicate with each other, but we'd stop now and then and sort of smooch and snuggle, and we have this yeah, we have thing. You know, we have this really good vibe. Um, all, all along, all with us, here comes this little dog. And I never thought to ask the family how the dog made it. I was really fixated on the kids, and they had a lot of bags. They were pretty exhausted from the walk. So we get to the bus. We're kind of saying our goodbyes. We're packing up. They're putting their, their baggage in the, the bins under the bus. And as I watched them boarding, I realized the dog isn't with them. And the little boy stands on the lowest step walking into the bus and is calling out to the dog. And the dog is tied to a tree. And now, because this is a sad story, it is pouring rain. So the dog is standing in the rain tied to a tree. And the little boy is waving and shouting out. And I can make out, you know, Habibi, Habibi. He's blowing kisses to the dog. And then the family boarded the bus and the door shut. And I absolutely lost my mind. And to be fair, at this point, Wade had been working 20 hour days for about a week. I was very physically tired. It was, it was emotionally intense work. I don't want you to take from this that I care more about a dog than I do about thousands of people, but there seemed to be something so unfair and cruel in that this dog had made it so far. This family who had given up so much, who carried all of their belongings on their backs, had to give up now their beloved family pet. So I'm gonna be honest, I fell apart. I went over, I untied the dog's leash. It was soaking wet. I held it in my arms. I sobbed into its smelly fur, and I made a giant spectacle. So soon enough, two of my teammates came over. I tell them the story. Now we're all sobbing. We're all crying. We're all acknowledging that this is ridiculous, but I'm basically at this point pulling a scarlet of hair. I'm like, as God is my witness, I will take this dog back to America with me. We will not leave this dog in Athens. And we're thinking how we're gonna bribe our hotelier to let us keep this smelly, disgusting dog with us in our hotel room. And we're making a scene, and at some point the Greek bus driver comes over and he says, Madam, what is wrong? And I, this dog, and this is people on the bus, and I can't get out. I can't get out a straight story, but he gets the gist, and he starts laughing. And I'm like, what a jerk. Like, I thought, I thought these were the good guys helping organize tickets and kind of helping the refugees navigate the port. So he calls his buddy over and talks to him in group for a while, and then the friend starts laughing. And I'm like, these insensitive assholes. Do they not see the pain wrapped up in this moment? And then his friend steps forward and he says, that's my dog. Her name is Baby. And sure enough, the dog starts scrambling to get out of my vice-like grip and returns to the arms of its owner, a Greek ticket broker. So that dog did get away, not from Syria and Turkey and ISIS and government militia and anti-government militia, but from international dog trafficker Sarah Gillum. <laughs> so I just want to close by saying that I got away too. I got away from my nightmares and my bouts of insomnia. I got away from feeling that I was stuck because my politicians were saying we won't let Syrians come to our state. They're all terrorists. I got away from the feeling of slacktivism, and all I could do was share articles on Facebook and hope people would read them. And I had the glorious, unbelievable gift of being able to do humanitarian work, which is a gift that I not only wish for all of you, but I believe is completely attainable for all of you. So the last thing I want to note is that everything changed for Greece on March 20th when the EU and Turkey struck a deal that closed the Balkan migration route and stopped the flow of refugees from Greece to Western Europe. And so at this point, there are 50,000 Iraqis, Yazidis, Afghans, and Syrians living in deplorable conditions in refugee camps in Greece, which is why I was on a plane three weeks later to go back with two beautiful women sitting in this row over here. But that is a story for another time.
Thank you.